introduction if you could tell us your name introduce yourself and what it is that you do my name is rebecca rogerson or gogo no Mathosi. um i've been a practicing sangoma for since 97 since 1997 i twasted in uh Dlamini and i twasted subsequently in other places in botswana um, and even here, work, work, uh, my first teacher was an Indigenous elder here. And I do, I facilitate healing. I, I hold space, I hold place for people for whole being healing. And I use, it's all rooted in Bungoma practices. But I, of course, have to make adaptations, individual and ancestral needs, and social cultural diversity in terms of people. So could you please tell us a little bit about, you know, how you came to do the spiritual work that you do? Um, in yeah, terms yeah. Of how did this calling surface in your life? And did you always have, you know, a strong relationship with your ancestors, your, your ancestral connection? No, I did not. I grew up in a North American, very mainstream, you know, kind of white upbringing. I mean, you know, we weren't, we weren't middle or upper class, but no, I wasn't exposed to it at all. Now, I had a grandmother who was born in the late 1800s, who uh, was really like a second mother to me. She had spent much of her time doing more European-based practices, so seances. She had the gift of sight, she had the gifts. So she identified me in a young age that I had the gifts, but she didn't talk about it a lot and didn't, um, didn't rear me in a clear manner in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people just said, oh, she's so precocious, you know. Um, when I, you know, one of my best friends says, yeah, I remember in elementary school, you'd pull all the kids together for a counseling session. You know, how's everyone feeling, right? Um, even though I didn't have that experience myself. Um, but I, I grew up, I went through, you, you know, quite a bit trauma. I still grew up with, of course, white privilege, uh, heterosexual privilege, but I did, you know, I did survive a, a, a lot of different forms of uh, sexual violence and abuse throughout my life. So like a lot of healers, I, I, life was not easy. Um, but basically, I met my now husband, who's a white South African in Israel. And I finished school, I was 18. And I was like, I'm going to South Africa, this is what I'm going to go do arrived i was so lucky because i arrived in august and mandiba uh, mandiba had just been inaugurated a few months before wow. so i wow. entered this exciting um sphere you know and and i was pretty outspoken like as a teenager i i really i don't know where it came from but i read malcolm x w.e.b dubois um i i was very invested in um in, in knowing more. So when I arrived, I was sort of a self-proclaimed Marxist. Uh, and, and still, you know, there were these very definitive racial and class spheres. So I, I, I did not fit in right now. South Africa is very different now, right? <laughs> At the time, you know, um, I certainly didn't fit in. I started by getting in very involved in working with street children. Uh, when I started to see sort of what was happening um, I was really affected by it and got involved. I, I think there was still some white savior complex there, you know. Um, then my, my partner and I decided to hitchhike. We were going to do the whole continent. Um, and and, and, and we, we did about eight months. So we traveled and we really, for him it was, what does this mean to be an African? As a white man, what does this mean? And for me, I wanted to understand african nests the continent the 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 variants right um so when we traveled i got really sick right i'm this like white canadian girl right and i got everything under the sun um but we kept traveling and and we were going to volunteer it was the ending of the rwandan genocide and we were trying to make our way to volunteer in some capacity but i i was too sick so by this point, I had been traveling, I had had malaria and amoebic dysentery probably for six to eight months untreated. I was really sick. So um, we, we, we took whatever money, we had no money left. And I flew back to Johannesburg and I saw doctors and they treated me. And so it began five, six, seven years, I couldn't get well. I saw doctor after doctor, um, I just couldn't get well. I started to get depressed. 
And then I started to get dreams. And then I started to have quote unquote supernatural experiences that, that were not clear to me, that was unknown to me. So after trying what seemed like everything, I was in Canada, I, I, a friend of mine, um, an Indigenous friend of mine referred me to an elder here. And I started to learn with him and I found home. I really found home in Indigenous knowledge systems and ceremony. You know, it made sense to me. Um, it clicked for me, but I still wasn't well. So came back to South Africa. I'm now open to these ways of understanding. Uh, consulted with the Sangoma and she said, you have not Twaso. So, you know, you're here, you must do it here. And I was like, okay. So I told my uh, family, which were like, what does this mean? I told my in-laws, which at the time were like, a witch doctor? You're moving to Soweto to be, right? Like this is 97. Now everybody's cool, right? Like it's different in, in our family. Um, and so I moved to Dlamini and, and, underwent, um, and underwent the process. And, and I would add that within a few months, I was well. And, and the gifts just came. It just, it just came. Given the conducive environment, it, it, it surfaced and came forward. I love that you mentioned, um, you mentioned the, the white savior complex that you feel that you had. Uh, oh, yeah. I think that that type of self-awareness you know, um, because there's a lot of people that have the complex but don't realize that they're not aware and also afraid to admit it once it's once they're confronted with that realization. What do you think drew you so much to Africa? What do you think it is that makes you feel so connected to Africa? Only the ancestors can answer that question. I can't answer that question. I yeah. was not some new age girl on some African adventure. This was not this was not what I was going for. I was not going for some kind of adventure. I was not going in some new age spiritual quest. That was not it at all. I, I mean, in, in Yiddish, we say beshert. It was meant to be. This wasn't an attraction. I wasn't sort of a white girl like, you know, oh, I only date black guys. Oh, I love black culture. Like I didn't, that, that wasn't kind of who I was. I was interested in, in black theory black politics, black thought, that, that I was always drawn to that. I had somebody who just influenced me one day and I was always drawn to that. I, I think it was just meant to be. Because this is, you know, this is a long running conversation. And I think it's so much more interesting also because you're on the other side of the world. Um, what are some of the challenges that you faced coming here and um, going through this initiation process in a predominantly African space? with African people, um, the, with the polarizing nature of it, um, how were you received, you know, and what, what, are, what are some of the challenges that you, that you faced? Well, I think the first thing that's important to mention is, <laughs> you know, how we use the word challenges. I, I, I'm a white woman who has geographic privileges, socioeconomic privileges. I, I mean, I'm privileged in innumerable, innumerable ways. So, what is challenge, right? Like even going to train, it's temporary. It's temporary. That level of su suffering and struggle is temporary. So, so I want to contextualize that a little bit, you know? Um, and of course, a lot of people felt sorry for me. They're like, there was a lot of shame, you know? <laughs> Cause barefoot on my knees, back up this poor white girl, right? And you're like, no, like, the, the sympathy, you know, that sympathy doesn't need to be there. So I think, I think the challenge is, you know, we have, to, I, I think it's something I have to be, it's important to be careful around that because those challenges are temporary, right? Um, and our privileges as, as white people are so privileged in so many ways that our privileges can't be compared to the experience of the average black South African and the average black Twasa, just, right. you know, point blank. Um, I think what was hard was the unlearning. When we go to Twasa, it is a deconstruction of personhood. You know, you're broken down, you're broken open to be born anew. And I had to unlearn everything I thought I knew, hmm. you know, as a person, as a woman, like I'm a feminist, I got rights. It's like, we don't care, you have to kneel. 
when a, an old man comes in and he's drunk and he's, you know, not behaving appropriately and he wants it in Cambodia, you serve it. You serve it. That humility was really important mm -hmm. because it's not just about, it's not about power and hierarchy. It can be if you don't have the right teachers, but ultimately it's about respect and humility. So, so unlearning who I thought I was, um, unlearning just my belief systems having to be reconstructed. The language piece was hard because if I didn't understand Suzulu, my teacher would just yell, <laughs> right? So I'd be like, okay, you know, people do that in English. You don't speak English, we'll talk louder and slower, right? <laughs> of course it doesn't work. Um, but she did speak English. So, so some of those pieces, I felt very taken care of. Right. You know, I felt very taken care of by the community. People were like, we cannot have a dead white Twasa. Like, we got to keep our eye, you know. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of offers of La Bola, you know, that went one way. I literally, I mean, I had a partner. I had no interest. Um, <laughs> but, but, but what's interesting was that I felt safer in the community than I would feel, let's say, in the northern suburbs. Now, again, maybe I was safer because I was also white, right? And people felt a sense of, we, we have to protect her. So again, privilege plays in there, I think, too. One thing that I appreciate is the sense of self-awareness that you have. And you mention the privilege quite often. And I think that's the one thing that um, makes the conversation so polarizing because a lot of people believe in the space, you know, the thing that they grapple with and that they um, resent you know, when it comes to the topic of a white Sangoma is the privilege. And also historically, um, it's yep. a conversation about how this is now something that's ours. Um, spiritually, it's sacred. It's a lot of sacredness. How can we be opening ourselves up and making ourselves vulnerable by our, allowing yeah. the oppressor into the space to be privy to some of our greatest secrets? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, a lot of white people are assholes, period. Um, you know, I'm just going to say it. Of course, of course, people feel that way because of the history of over 500 years of colonization and practices and cultural beliefs and worldviews and ways of being that were um, people were murdered for and oppressed for and attacked and sought to be annihilated. So, of course, people feel that way. And, and how do we know? you know, by having white people in the space that they, that, that they come in the right way. I mean, of course people feel that way, as they should, right? And you have the same thing in Canada. You have Indigenous-based ceremonies. White people aren't allowed. You have others where they are. So this isn't, you know, this isn't, this isn't my place to convince anybody. And people can, you know, feel, I have the privilege to be a custodian. So you know, Black South Africans are, 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 of course, should feel any way they feel. If they don't feel comfortable um, with white people doing this work, that, that's their right, right? That is, that is their right. So as I said, I'm not here, here to convince anyone. You know, some will say, like Michael Bella and other people will say that the uh, Badimo call you despite race, ethnicity, or culture. Mm. So that, that's part of the argument, right? Um, that's part of the argument. You, you, you can be called no matter who you are, specifically to Bungoma, right? We hear other people say, well, how can you? If you don't have Nguni-based ancestors or they're not from here, how is that possible? Um, I think we carry complicated histories, very complicated histories. You know, I was speaking to my mother yesterday saying, you know, the things we talk about now, your generation didn't talk about. People didn't talk about mental health, uh, mental health issues. White people didn't talk about so-and-so has a black girlfriend or this person married an indigenous person. Like th there were so many secrets, um, so much secrecy as a result of colonization, right? So our histories are very complicated. We don't entirely know what we're made up of. I also think that Bungoma specifically, despite colonization and, 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 and apartheid and, and cultural hybridity, there, there is an essence there that has remained intact that allows for a, a, a doorway and access to, to spirit 
that isn't apparent in a lot of other systems, even indigenous knowledge systems. So, you know, people are still connected to their land, even in terms of population. Canada, you know, you have to remember that indigenous people are here and living and thriving, but colonization sought to, it was genocide, right? So, um, and, and we're seeing this happening throughout the world. So there is something that, um, of course, it, 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 it culture isn't permanent, it's hybrid, it's changing, but there's something there. And, and so I think that's an important piece. And I also think, I, I really was reflecting on this today and feeling like, you know, just like South Africa became a social, political beacon and transformer I feel like that's happening now spiritually. I feel like this medicine specifically is going to change the world. And our ancestral work is going to change the world. Our ancestors are asking us to mend. We have to take care of the past. And for me, my work is how can I tend to these histories? Because I always say, you know, white people will always say, well, I'm not my ancestors. I didn't do what my ancestors did. I disagree. We are our ancestors. They live in us. They are embodied in us. They speak through us. Their narratives are in us. Their histories are in us. I am my ancestors. I am responsible for those histories. Not just because it's present now, but because it still lives through me. So... I believe we're being called now to tend to it. That's why Abundao is so strong right now, because that's the mender. That's the reconciler, right? Of, of, of whether it's foreign or lineal, it does that work. So I believe the ancestors are speaking now, asking us, tend to the dead, tend to the ancestors, mend these things of the past that show up in the present. So for me, I humble myself to that work. I'm often called to work with the dead that haven't been tended to. And I apologize. I'll arrive and say, I'm sorry, you got a white girl today. I'm not speaking your language, you know, and, and, and maybe I'm not what you thought I was going to be, but, but let me tend to you. So in a way, if done properly, it's all, it can also be about amends. Mm for any sangoma right mm. so that's how i see the work and also for me how am i showing up holding space and loving and caring people how am i doing that mm. and people that are trying to navigate these systems that my ancestors put in place and and that my people still uphold how am i a fellow disruptor and also how am I part of that solution of healing what can I offer in my way how can I use my gifts to improve life for the individual and the collective past and present right yeah you mentioned you know Africans that will go to ourselves whose ancestors are predominantly Nguni and all these different African cultures I'm curious as to when you when you when you went to Twasa, how how did that work uh, relative to you? Because um, did you also go through the Nguni process? Yes, I went through the Nguni process, and I also went through Abundao. I think it's important to also remember there's a piece that I'm coming to learn after my over 20 years of doing this work, and the ancestors tell me this, right? They, they also talk about, so, so of course we've got our blood lineal ancestors. And as you know, we also have those collective ancestors or forces that work through us. Yes. We, also, yeah. we also become adopted by the ancestors. They're telling me this now. They're telling me, shame, half these people in the world don't have ancestors anymore. We're going to help them. We're yeah. going to help them. So there is this kind of spiritual adoption that occurs. This is important. Uh, and also with your gobella, there's a, a, a kind of adoption that occurs too. Because not only are you addressing your ancestry, but you're becoming part of, of, of her work and her or his ancestry too. So you're also carrying 
you're carrying that as well. Um, but for me, when I first was it, the up and down stuff hadn't, it, it wasn't completed. So when I finished, even though everything was in order and right, and, and, and props to my Gobella, the up and down stuff hadn't been, it, it, it hadn't been completed because that up and down work is, is, is complex. You know, it's kind of trending now and everyone's in, in, interested in it. It's very complex, very. You can't just go and bring liquor to the water and pasla and then get in and clean yourself. No, there be, there's so many nuances and so many complications that, that Afro Sabbath you've covered, right? I love that you take that up and say, let's talk about Nzuza, let's talk about, right? Because it, it, it's more complicated. So that still needed to be put in order. And I believe that that is um, the dominant work for me because Abandao is that, is that mender between people and beings. So how did the calling and answering this calling, how did it change your life? What difference do you, what clear difference do you see in yourself before answering the calling and after? Well, first of all, the work is my life. So <laughs> that's the first thing. If you think, you know, when you do this healing work, oh, you're going to have this, you're going to have, no, this goes first. And even with your own family, they understand that. Mm -hmm. they, they understand that. It changes every single thing. You are born anew. You are born anew. And, and your ancestors, you know, I always say they're directive and they're generally clear. They, they gonna tell you, you're not eating that. So as soon as I finished Atwasa, they're like, no more alcohol, none, nope. And I'm like, okay. And, and if I push my luck and let's say I'd have a tot or a, you know, something small, I would feel the next day like I had had 24 drinks. Yeah. So they're like, nope. Um, they, you, every, area cc i don't even know where to start if i drive they will say don't go that way if there's an issue don't go that way um the food i eat how the how i prepare the food um it affects your sleeping i can be working through the night i'm sleeping and i'm working i've gone here i've gone there i'm working on this baby i'm doing that you know i wake up i'm like oh i'm tired i was working all night um it affects our mood and if things aren't in order you know, I always say, Sam, well, we can be very moody, you know, uh, and if we don't tend to, to, um, to, to the ancestors, then, then our moods really get off, right? And we're really affected. Every area of life, I, I can't even compare my life before my life. Now, this is my life. This work, this work is, this goes, this is everything. And spirit directs everything. Um, before I talk to you today, I asked them, can I do this interview? What must I talk about? What do you want me to burn? Uh, they say, wear these beads. So it, it, it's a constant surrendering. And I always say, it's a calling within callings. You don't go, you know, graduate and you're like, okay, no, no, you're, oh, there's going to always be levels and callings within calling. And, and it's an ongoing surrendering you know, listening, attuning, surrendering, doing as you're instructed, following through what you need to do in all areas of your life, you know, and, and, and that's the same for everybody, not just Sangomas. When you start working well with your ancestors, they're going to tell you, this man is not for you. And you're going to say, no, he seems okay. And you're going to see it's not going to work out. They're going to choose your friends. They're going to choose your partner. They're even going to choose your patients. Mm. you may get somebody you're like oh hell no and they're going to say hell yes you're going to work with that person you're going to do that work so mm. everything changes in life yeah and your family how was your family and your close friends how are they about you know now understanding what it is that you're going through well it's been so long right yeah. this has been over over 20 years um i have a very good partner so that's the first thing. As a single woman, you can't be married to somebody who doesn't understand the work, support the work, and, and completely back you up. 
you, you, you just can't. You need somebody who's a healer too and or somebody who understands what needs to be done. So I'm very blessed that way. When I say to my partner, okay, you know, we need to do a goat. It's not easy in Canada <laughs> to get a goat. To, these practices are not easy here. Um, uh, my family, my children have grown in this. Like you with your mom, you've grown in this. This is what you know. No, nobody thinks anything. They're like, that's mom. When there's a play date, you know, don't let the kids go in that room because then they're going to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But the, this is just, this is just life. Same with friends. I can't have friendships with people that, that don't value or appreciate or understand me in this work. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's not going to work. Yeah. So what is your understanding of, you know, new age spirituality and how it coincides with traditional spiritual work? Do you think it works with it, against it? I'm, I'm not a huge fan of new age spirituality, and I'll tell you why. That isn't to say there aren't things to be learned or adopted. Mm -hmm. These indigenous knowledge systems will give you everything you need to have a good life and live in a good way. You don't need anything else, right? It, we, we always think things outside are better. You know what I mean? We always think, especially in South Africa, there's a real issue there with that. Oh, this is from Europe. Oh, this is from America. So what? You don't need anything else. Mm -hmm. you, you know, this, these indigenous knowledge systems and, and Bugoma itself, this is a lifetime of study, right? And learning and, 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 and seeking to understand in a way of living. So you don't, you know, you don't need anything else. Um, I guess I also feel like some of the new age stuff is dangerous because it's often culturally appropriative and consumptive. So a good example, especially, and I see this by fellow white people, um, you know, where they just take what they like and, you know, like it's like smudging kits or the new hit, you know, or a great example is yoga. Like yoga is an ancient sacred practice coming from India, right? And now it's like, we know what it's like now. I, I'm not saying that, that practices can't be adapted and they can't move transnationally, they can. But I'm talking about the appropriation and consumption of cultural practice for our own interest, particularly you know, of white people. Pick what I like, leave the rest. My other fear with a lot of new age is that it's about good vibes, but doesn't really address inequities. Like, that's great you're feeling good vibes. Half the people that have had to come to this ceremony don't have gas, petrol money to get here. Or they're going home and dealing with, you know, GBV. Like, so it's very important that our spirituality addresses and tends to the realities of the lived experiences, particularly of Black and Indigenous and people of color. Um, it may sound strange coming also from a white Canadian. I'm a little bit of a purist in that I believe cultural hybridity occurs. Culture's never stagnant. It's changing. Look at a lot of our Bungoma practices, the use of incense and different things that are in innately Indian or potentially Hindu. There's a lot of influence there. The tradition of giving people tea and biscuits when they, when they come over, I mean, that, that's colonial, right? So customs, culture changes. However, the innate principles and values have to be there and have to continue to be, um, you know, practice and, and, you know, and engage with. Um, so, so that's my only sort of pluck with it. Do you think that new age spirituality in its essence, um, is rooted in African spirituality? Would you say that? No, <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> that's my problem with, with new age spirituality is it is not rooted in anything. You know, it, it's this and a little bit of this and a good vibes and yeah. this feels good. And we need to get back to our indigenous knowledge systems, teachings and way of life. That applies to white folks too. That applies even for me. I'm a Jewish woman, right? And when what I love about Judaism is that when I strip away certain things, I'm like, these are indigenous practices. Anointing, burning, all that. This is, you know, uh, Moses on Mount Sinai. I mean, the guy's in trance, right? 
he's 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 he close he's speaking through him like that's what's going on so i think what's key is that we don't it's okay to to have some level of hybridity and crossover yeah. but we also need to be rooted in something you know our tree needs to have roots so um and and that's where we can learn the most and know the most and i believe it's in these earth based traditions and indigenous knowledge systems worldwide europeans had that too they had that too part of you know the defects of colonization for them was they lost that they yeah. lost the you know i mean it's still alive for many people so um i i think that this is key too that we need to get back to that and and you know deep healing work it, it's blood sweat and tears mm -hmm. it's not just fragrant soaps and good vibes no you know it's about embodied systems and methods this is why this is what i love so much about this way of life when you futa you're cleaning up your body but you're cleaning up your spirit you're cleaning out your mind you're cleaning out your heart those herbs that you drink are not just herbs. When we make an Ambiza, it's not just to, I have high BP. We also are taking care of those spiritual elements. Those plants are taking care of certain ancestors that need tending to. So whole being, indigenous knowledge systems goes beyond whole being of mind, body, spirit. Whole being means the dead, means the elevated ancestors means our community, means all beings, our animals, our plants, everything. New Age doesn't, doesn't quite get this yet. We need to turn to our leaders and in indigenous knowledge systems to, to show us our way forward, to bring us back, to help us remember. I wanted to find out what decolonization means to you and what part spirituality, specifically, I think maybe African spirituality, plays in the process of, of decolonization, you know, of our culture, our land, our economy. Listen, I'll give you my two cents, but really we need to be turning to our Black, Indigenous, and people of color and our, 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 our elders to be showing us our way our way forward around decolonization, right? My positionality, I'm a white woman. So so take my two cents, but our, our, we, we should be following the lead of uh, good in order leadership um, around this. So, so I'll give my two cents. We can't return to pre-European contact. You know, we can't. So contact has happened. And, and colonization is still in place. I mean, as they say, can we ever say we're post-colonial? <laughs> because colonialism goes on and on and on, um, yeah, right? I think, of course, decolonization is about socioeconomics, cultural, but it's also the spiritual, mental, and emotional pieces too. It's, it's about self-determination. It's about, uh, you know, self-sovereignty. For me, when I envision decolonization, uh, and again, I am the follower of Black and Indigenous leadership on this, so I can give my opinion, but, you know, as white people, we really need to shut up, sit down, and, and, and follow at this point. That's part of decolonization. Can we close our mouths, open our ears, learn, you know, learn and, and, and follow? I would hope that decolonization is intersectional feminism, that it's non-patriarchal, non-toxic, patri you know, patriarchal, that it's not capitalistic. You know, when we talk about decolonizing, we're not just talking about race and culture, we're talking about capitalism, consumption, heteronormativity, ableism, sexism. Um, I would also hope that, um, that decolonization incorporates our preservation of the earth we are destroying it. Mm. So, so that's that's part of our work, that we become non-invasive human beings. Um, I believe that, it, that as a white person, I'm responsible to be a fellow disruptor um, and, that, and that I should strive to be unprivileged and that, um, that I should be non-complicit in all matters and that I should be leading and showing other white people how to do that. Ultimately, 
as white people, we constructed race. We have implemented these systems. It, it's our job to address it. Um, we need Indigenous knowledge systems to do that. We, we can't do it without that because this isn't just a theoretical or political idea. We need healing. We, we need healing in, in every area of our society and our lives. So spirituality is just as important to decolonization as economic freedom, right? Mm. Uh, we also need places to be able to breathe that are, that are non-oppressive uh, and affirming and loving and caring. That's the other thing about, you know, for me, my healing work. How am I caring and loving and tending and encouraging? Most people don't have that. It's just hustle, survive. We need those spaces um, to breathe and, and to be cared for. Um, decolonization helps everyone, right? It, it's not just about helping you, you know, decolonization, I think maybe you white people think they're exempt from it, but, but no, we need to be freed of oppression and, 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 and oppressing. Um, and we need to tend to our, by tending to our ancestors and attending to, you know, these afflictions, what's infl afflicted them, what afflicts them now. Um, this is our healing balm, right? Yeah. Decolonization yeah. isn't just a term or political idea. It's got to be an embodied spiritual experience rooted in indigenous knowledge systems with the with it led by black and indigenous people. And, and I would like to add trans people. Trans people are so important to our society right now. They are so um, gifted in, in code switching and navigating these different worlds. And I believe there is medicine they have there to, to, to lead us forward. Mm. And our job is also to love and care and support our leaders and our healers, right? Yeah. And the perception of African spirituality it started to spill over into the mainstream. And there's a lot more talk about Ubungo. Yeah, yeah. But we've, we, we, you know, for the longest time, we dealt with a huge stigma. And people are now starting to educate themselves. You know, what's your view of the perception of it, your experience of the perception of it? How do you hope to see a change in the future? I don't want to see... Uh culture as transactional mm -hmm. so even though it's trending right now it's wonderful to see people again i cannot speak on behalf of black communities and blackness and and return to identity i cannot speak on that i can say i think it's wonderful that young people are reclaiming identity culture history spiritual practices it's really exciting really where their parents didn't have that opportunity as a result of oppression and colonization and apartheid that people are doing that i think it's really really exciting i think people need community they need togetherness i think people are you will find that in bungoma practices right um i just i i just don't want to see it become transactional or or a product right that it's trending and becomes a product. So that's my piece with that. Some of my concern and, and my experience here and in South Africa is this fervent uh, religious Christianity um, rooted in, of course, colonization, um, whereby it's, it's still white Jesus, right? It's still white Jesus and it's still about damnation. Um, I mean, I always laugh and say, it makes me laugh when people say, oh yeah, traditionally, you know, we don't have LGBTQ. Yeah, being gay, it's not our culture. It's like, oh, it sure is. Gayness, queerness has been around for millions of years. It's colonization that brought in legislation prohibiting it. So this is embodied. These are embodied colonial myths, actually. Mm. Um, I think... I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting. And I think, as I said earlier, I think South Africa has a lot to offer. You guys are ahead of the game, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, 
I really feel like that right now. I mean, we just had our TRC here. We just had it. Um, but that being said, we see all over the world, CC. it is so exciting, this revolution happening. And it is also a spiritual revolution. People are done. They are done with these systems of destruction. They are done with gender-based violence. They are done with patriarchy. Right now, we, we have people that have built houses uh, in front of pipelines. They're like, you will not destroy our lands. We will not allow corporations to destroy our lands. Um, so people are, are standing up. And this is a spiritual, cultural fight. The revolution has to be that spiritual cultural fight, knowing who you are, knowing that medicine, being sc truly schooled in the indigenous knowledge systems, um, and, and, then, and then going forward and demanding these changes. So I, I think it's exciting. And, and, and my only fear, as I said, is this continued missionization, right? I, I don't know if you saw this. There was this video that went around of this minister shaving women's vaginas did you see this he shaves her vagina i'll say yeah he shaves her vagina and then puts water like blessing it what and, and then, yeah and yeah for real this is for real so we see this and, and and i've also seen we know now that even in bungoma not just in the ministry i have many people you know that 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 i see are women that are affected by gender-based violence that deal with rape from ministers. We know this goes on in Bungoma. We know that. Yeah. So these things have to end. We need to also check ourselves around oppressions within these practices. These practices should not, these practices cannot be homophobic, transphobic, uh, sexist, oppressive, we, we, we cannot have sexual violence going on in this. So that, that we have to check ourselves on. And, and, um, and I think it's changing. People are proud. Yeah. People are proud. Yeah. And, and people aren't in a position where their parents were in. You know, they're like, fuck you. Yeah. I know who I am and I, and I won't tolerate this. So I'm happy to see the youth reclaiming those spaces and demanding that. And I feel I have so much to learn and listen um, to that because there's a fearlessness. They're like, no, no, uh-uh, we done with this. And, and um, I don't want to say their parents weren't doing that. We know it's, it's a youth that, that, that drive, right? Yeah. And that, that, that have an apartheid too. So um, I think it's exciting. And, and I, just, I just want everyone to just patla, you know, be with your ancestors um get to know them attune to them they're going to tell you what to do you know you don't need to go to five six sangomas to get <laughs> different advice they'll talk to you they are so alive and loud right now they'll, they'll tell you what to do how to do it um you know make use of make use of the healers when when you need the direction when you need the guidance and i just want to encourage people i know this this life right now is hard with COVID, with, with money, with, you know, this is hard, just trying to get by. And I'm white and I am not living in poverty. This is tough. I just want to encourage people, please do your healing work. Just do it. Do your healing work. Go in, go deep, go hard. Uh, have your ancestors carry you through it. Because if we do that, this is how we're going to change this world. This is how we're going to this is how we're going to shift things Absolutely. when we're tending to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so.